Vegetative reproduction of mosses at home is actually quite possible. Although it does sound strange and unrealistic, this is only because many people believe that mosses should grow in swamps and in forests and not at home. But I'm sure that after this video, you will change your mind. You know, understand that there's actually nothing complicated about it at all. It is nowhere more difficult than growing an orchid or a bromeliad on your windowsill because they, much like mosses, belong to epiphytes. This means that mosses, for example, attach themselves to trees and use the tree as support and they are not parasitic so they don't suck nutrients from the tree and they don't harm it, but rather receive food from decomposed organic matter stuck in the bark of the tree and of course photosynthesis. The mosses have root-like formations of rhizoids, which mosses use to hold on to and for support. And they also have suction capabilities. They use rhizoids, root-like structures, to attach themselves to the surface and absorb water and nutrients. But not through rhizoids, through capillary systems that hair-like rhizoids form. Rhizoids are capable of forming from any cell of moss and are responsible for vegetative reproduction of mosses. From rhizoids, a protonema is formed. And from this protonema, leafy gamophytes or new mosses grow. In short, mosses are able to grow quickly and easily. This property explains why some mosses are invasive. Whether it is necessary to rinse the moss before planting, do it only if there are obvious signs of dirt they can be rinsed in osmosis water or in a weak solution of potassium permanganate generally mosses are clean they don't have insects or any parasites after rinsing the moss gently squeeze out any excess water don't be afraid to damage your moss it will not break remember you step on it in nature and it does not break and it will not die so what do you need to grow your moss? Make sure to choose the right container. First, I need to determine what kind of moss I have. And this is why I need to study the living conditions in which this specific species exists in nature. If I don't know the moss, when collecting it, I need to pay attention to where the moss is growing, in a sunny place or in a shady place, like on a rock or in a swamp. I divide the mosses by habitat into wet and dry habitat. The dry mosses I have today include Tortula ruralis, or star moss, pink cushion moss, or leucobrium moss, two species of polytrichum, or hair cup mosses, hypnum cupressiforum, or hypnum moss, springy turf moss, or turf moss, and dicranium, or mood moss. Wet mosses like to grow on bogs and shady wet places near rivers, springs, and lakes, although they can be found in open sunny places as well. Today I have two species of sphagnum moss, red bog moss and sphagnum riparium, baby tooth moss or plagiomonium, and I have one species from the liverworts division, Bazania trilobata. So I need to prepare a container and I need to prepare the substrate. Dry mosses need more ventilation. So I use a strawberry or a peach box, much like the ones found in your local grocery store. Since they have holes in it, of course you can make it yourself. In any transparent plastic box, small river stones are also suitable for the bottom and for drainage of the bed. And so that the stones don't slip through the holes, I line the bottom with a piece of tool. On top, I put activated charcoal, or just crushed charcoal pieces for barbecue. I also wrap this in a mesh material. You can use any synthetic mesh. All of this is in order to avoid mixing the soil substrate with the drainage, and to be able, of course, to change the coal if it gets dirty. I prepare the substrate as a mixture of sterile garden soil with peat moss, in addition with rotted sawdust. Then I mix the substrate. One third of garden soil, one third of peat moss, and one third of decaying tree parts, bark, branches, sawdust. You can crumble up a rotten tree stump if you find one in the forest. Make sure you disinfect it in an oven beforehand for 30 minutes 
or in potassium permanganate. If you don't want to do that, if you don't want to get your hands dirty, chop up some pine cones and they will serve just as good as any rotted wood. Perlite or expanded clay can be added to activated carbon and the substrate in order to improve air circulation. Garden potting mixes usually have them in their decomposition. Peat is required for enrollment and peat moss is very important since peat mosses make the substrate pH remain acidic. Almost all mosses grow on acidic and semi-acidic soils. You don't need to use too much substrate. Dry mosses grow on a thin layer of forest decay that accumulates on rocks or even in crevices and concrete walls. So one centimeter thick is sufficient. I put everything in a more spacious tray and water only from the bottom. Bottom irrigation is necessary for dry mosses, though the capillary system is formed by the rhizoids of the mosses, they can raise the water upward and deliver the moisture when necessary. That way it doesn't get overwatered. They absorb it kind of like a sponge, and if they are regularly waterlogged, they can begin to deteriorate much like orchids when they are flooded with water. Remember, these are epiphytes and air circulation is essential. So for wet mosses, I don't add a substrate since in stagnant water, even in the presence of coal, putrefactive processes cannot be avoided. But instead of a substrate, I'm going to add pieces of fresh or rotten bark, wood, or any pine cones. They are needed to acidify and support the moss. Instead of crushed activated carbon, I'm going to put in a few pieces of charcoal. In general, sphagnum can grow in a vase with clean water for quite a long time. And we do have a video on our channel of how to grow 100 orchids from one without cakey paste, where you can see how sphagnum grows with orchids just in water on the windowsill. For wet mosses, I use glass vases or containers. For example, with sphagnum, it's always important to have water. Rhizoids form a capillary system and promote water absorption. The property of absorbing 15 to 20 times more water than their actual dry weight is really, really interesting. And the antibacterial property is also used during the war to treat bleeding wounds. The ability to absorb water makes sphagnum mosses an ideal substrate for orchids. It is necessary to maintain the water level and it is clearly visible in glass vases. In addition, the height of the vase is important as well since sphagnum can grow up to 15 centimeters. I'm not going to close the vase too tightly even though damp mosses like almost 100% humidity. Remember that air circulation is very important. Use rainwater or any filtered osmosis water to water your moss. So make sure you please follow your local conservation regulations, especially when collecting moss. Mosses go quite quickly and it is good to take a piece of moss with an area of the substrate on which it grows, be it a piece of leaf or a piece of rotted stump. This can preserve the rhizoids and the moss will grow much faster. Sometimes the moss is separated directly from the substrate by rotted forest debris. In this case, you don't need to add a lot of substrate. A sunny windowsill or a balcony can be ideal for this. If there is none, then artificial lighting will also work. Mosses are used as a substrate for orchids and florists use mosses for decoration for terrariums for growing saprophytes, epiphytes, sundews, and other carnivorous plants, and so on. So, of course, it makes sense to give it a try. Thank you so much for watching. Leave any comments or questions you have below, and don't forget to subscribe.